and miracles. Uh, and it's a very important topic, a topic in which there's an enormous amount of confusion. Uh, Father, we pray that the confusion will be brushed away this morning. We pray that you'll reveal yourself and reveal the ministry. Catch up. Okay. Uh, now, the, the area of healing is one that was quite controversial. Uh, I believed in healing for a long while before it ever happened. I used to pray for people and pray for people, nothing had happened. And I got so discouraged that I would say to people, uh, look, don't ask me to pray for healing, you'll probably drop dead after I pray for you. I, I just never saw any success. And then I studied the scriptures and studied the scriptural way of praying for people to be healed, which we'll cover, and I began to see success. And, you know, 25, 30% of the people I pray for would get healed, uh, or at least measurably improved. Uh, and so that was a big improvement on 0%. Uh, it's still not 100%. Uh, and we'll look at some of those things. Uh, now, the gift of healing is in the Greek, healings. It therapia is the word, they use the plural form of it. So it's healings. So we find that uh, back in the early church, someone like Jesus or Paul would heal just about everybody. But as, the, as those high level people aren't around so much anymore, he, uh, healings, so we find that there's someone who'll be very good at praying for backs. And that's all they heal is backs, because we're a long way from the New Testament. Someone else will pray for cancer and be great at, at healing cancer. Someone else will be uh, good at praying for Alzheimer's or something. So uh, we find that because we're a, a lot further down the uh, power tree <laughs> than, say, the apostles, uh, we tend to have healings that work for uh, uh, better in some areas and not so much in others. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we will find that there's still some people around who have a generalized gift of healing everybody, but they're kind of rare. Uh, and we find healing is right through, right from the beginning of the New Testament to the end. From Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus comes out after the temptation and starts healing everybody, right through to the book of Revelation, where the, the uh, leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations, there's no more uh, crying or pain. Healing is absolutely right through the New Testament. You can't dodge it. Uh, and Jesus would say to his disciples, Go out, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and say the kingdom of God is now among you. It was core to the mission of the early church, was this whole uh, healing thing. But when we get to it today, it's so controversial, and there's questions about how do we uh, balance it with medicine. Well, there's no conflict. God gives wisdom to the doctors. We pray for wisdom for the doctors, uh, and they get it, because God answers our prayer. We, because we pray for wisdom, the doctors become wise. Uh, and I have no contention with the medical profession at all. I will never tell you to throw away your medication or not to go to a doctor. By all means, go to your doctor. Uh, uh, but, but the other hand, uh, God has provided us supernatural means for healing. And especially in nations where medication is extremely expensive, places I've been like Philippines and Indonesia and other places, uh, often healing from the church is the only practically available source of healing because the communities are remote uh, and I remember my most uh, awesome time of healing was in Indonesia uh, was right out in the back of Borneo what the old it's now Kalimantan uh, and it's a little place and there's 300 people packed into a room smaller than this I just jammed in and I prayed and I and I and I just kept coming and I kept coming and I kept laying hands on them and I thought and, and the, the emotion in the room was was incredible and I thought, and my reaction was, there's so much emotion here that, you know, because I don't like a lot of emotion. Uh, uh, and I, I began to sort of get skeptical about it. Uh, and then weeks later, we got a, a testimony from the pastor that said, you know, over 300 people were healed in that evening. Uh, but they needed it. There was no other medicine there. We were in the, right in the middle of the jungle and the, uh, the plantations, and it was like really out there. And so God, the only way they were going to get healed was if someone turned up and prayed for them. Uh, and so it's, it's a very much needed gift. And so I, I find no tension with that. And as we go through, because it's an area of controversy, if you want to ask questions, ask questions. Now I'm going to try and finish up at exactly 5 past 10 and leave a big chunk of time for uh, the praying for one another and activating gifts. Okay? So don't let me waffle. 
It's your responsibility. Keep me on track. Uh, okay. Uh, miracle signs and wonders are rarer than healing and tend to happen in clusters. So we find that Acts 8, for instance, uh, Philip goes down to Samaria and there's a lot of miracles happen there and then there's sort of a gap and there's another gap. So miracles, big capital M miracles, are rarer than healings. I, I, the Bible tends to make a distinction between healing and miracles. Healing's everyday stuff, you know, exorcisms every day, but capital M in miracles like people being raised from the dead uh, tend to be during times of revival and church planning. Healing and miracles were expected spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, where it says the gifts of healings, it just rattles it off. And in, and in James, uh, they instruct church elders on how to heal the sick. You come, anoint with oil, pray over them, the prayer of faith, and the sick person will be raised up. Healing was just a normal, everyday part of church life in the New Testament, and praying for the sick should be a normal, everyday part of church life in every church around the world. Uh, and we should pray in faith. Now, before I go any uh, further on that, why don't we see so many people heal? Uh, I'll address that straight up. Uh, I think it's two reasons. One, we pray the wrong way, which I'll address later. We, we pray in a, a faithless kind of limp kind of way, you know, if it be thy will, etc., etc., kind of healing. And the second reason is we, as at this end of the time, 2,000 years later, we haven't seen the big revival miracles. We haven't seen uh, it happen. So our faith is this big. Right? It's hard for us to believe in healing. We weren't, we're not there in front of Jesus as he heals a few thousand people. So we're, we're timid about it. We're timid about it. We think, well, what are people going to think? And uh, Pastors like myself, and I put the blame not on the sick person, but on the pastors and the elders, because we don't have enough faith. We're, we're timid, we, we've got scientific rationalist mindsets, uh, and we don't really believe that the healing's going to happen. We hope it happens. And hoping it happens is a lot different from believing that it's going to happen. And uh, we haven't jumped over that hurdle yet to believing that it's going to happen. Uh, and and uh, I struggle with that personally. So for me, I find that for my healing... Sometimes I'll have three to six months where I pray for people, boom, 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 they're healed. And, and people are healed of blood cancers and wonderful things happen. And that switches off. I think, where'd it go? Where'd my healing go? Uh, so I see, for me, I think it's my fault. There's something spiritually in me that switches on and then switches off. Uh, and, 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 and It should be by faith. And so we as pastors need to keep ourselves in the state where healing flows through us. And elders, and for you in the congregation, if you have a gift of healing, you need to be in that state. Now, the healing ministry of Jesus was part of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, Isaiah 53, 3 to 5, says he, he carries our sicknesses. Let's have a look at that uh, briefly. Isaiah 53. Okay, and then it's fulfilled in Matthew 8, where it quotes it. Isaiah 53. He is, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. So, the, 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 by his stripes we are healed is the last line there. It's talking about physical healing. And then the line before that, if the chastisement of our peace was upon him, that's mental healing. And then uh, the uh, wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities is spiritual healing. So that's all there in Isaiah 53. And, and Matthew 8, uh, it says that uh, uh, 8, 16 and 17, which is the fulfillment of that in the New Testament, Jesus is healing a large number of people. And so Matthew says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits of the word and healed all who were sick, that it might be uh, fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So it's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Jesus was supposed to be a healer. He was supposed to be someone who bore the, our sicknesses on the cross. And wherever Jesus went, he always saw sickness as something to be healed. He came up to a whole bunch of head, he had compassion on them, and he healed them. A person would come up, he's a leper, he would heal them. A blind person, he would heal them. A deaf person, he would heal them. 
a dead child, he would raise them from the dead. He never ever came up to someone and said, nah, look, you know, I this leprosy, you're not patient enough yet, you've got to stay for another two years as a leper, and when you've learned patience, then I'll heal you. He never did that to anybody. He always healed them, he always healed what they wanted, when they wanted, where they wanted, right there and then. And some of, now, I'll bet you a secret, you know, people like me who are insecure about healing, we make up excuses why we, people aren't healed. And some of those excuses aren't very good. Oh, you don't have enough faith. That's what an insecure person will say. Or you need to learn patience. So that you're blaming the victim. Right? Because the pastor or the evangelist or whatever is insecure. Now I and other people need to get over our insecurity and stop blaming the victim. Right? It's not their fault. When people came to Jesus, they were in all sorts of spiritual states. They were probably drunk. They were probably sinners. They were probably all sorts of things. And no matter how messed up they were, he healed them. No matter how little their faith was, he healed them. Right? Uh, and when the disciples couldn't heal an epileptic boy, he didn't he rebuke the epileptic child for not having enough faith. The kid was unconscious. Right? He rebuked the disciples. He said, why couldn't you heal him? Get your act together. Right? And so, where I'm the one that should take the blame. Right? If I'm praying, it's my responsibility to have the faith, to have the compassion, and not blame the victim for not getting healed. Right? It's not the person with cancer's fault that they're not healed. It, we need to say, okay, Lord, we're going to pray. We're going to learn how to pray. We're not very good at doing the healing thing that, and we ought to tell people we're not very good at doing the healing thing, but we're going to do our best. We're going to try. We're going to learn. We're going to activate this gift. And we're going to move in the spirit and we're going to learn, we're going to overcome our lack of faith as pastors and, and we're going to grow in faith and we're going to do the healing thing a bit more. We're going to get bold. And, and you know what? I'm going to be mean. I'm going to ask you to do the healing thing too. <laughs> right? I want you to pray for your friends and I want you to, to grow in faith because some of you are appointed by God to have a gift of healing. Right? And I want you to move in that. I want you to be bold and I want you to be brave. Okay. Jesus saw healing as a manifestation of divine authority and power. Let's just pick the first reference there. Matthew 8, 9 to 13. That was just before the last reference we looked at. Matthew 8. Nine to thirteen. Okay. Uh, and, and here's the centurion, and uh, he, he says, "Lord, I'm not worthy. You should come under my roof, but only speak a word. My servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes; and to another, come, and he comes. And my servant do this, and he does it." When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, etc. Uh, and then in verse 13, he says, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. So the centurion said, Healing is a matter of authority. Jesus, you have authority, and when you say it, it's going to happen. So because Jesus has heavenly authority, he speaks and healing happens. So, now I want to, to, to clarify something here. You also have heavenly authority. Of course you don't have the heavenly authority of Jesus Christ. But you also have heavenly authority because according to Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, you are seated in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. You're citizens of heaven. That is why Christians can cast out demons, because we have heavenly authority. In the Old Testament you don't see anyone casting out demons. You don't see Elijah casting out demons or anyone because the cross hadn't come yet. But now the cross is there. We're seated in heavenly realms. We're able to judge angels, which it says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, uh, 2 and 3. We have a certain amount of heavenly authority because we're sons and daughters of the living God. And things below us, like demons and diseases, we can command. And that's why... Uh, uh, Peter goes to the lame man at the gate beautiful and he says in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk and he uses his heavenly authority and the person rises up and walks and later on he gets Tabitha who's dead and he says you know get up and she gets up and so on and so forth 
there's all these commands because we're allowed to issue the commands because we have legitimate heavenly authority because we're citizens of heaven right? we have died we, we, our life is now in Christ Jesus and we have legitimate heavenly authority we're seated in Christ uh, in Christ Jesus uh, and uh, so I'll go through the illustration once again okay I've done it before but I'll do it again uh, this is the Christian the Bible's Christ the Christian is in Christ right? so we Christ dies so what happens to us we die with Christ uh, Christ rises from the dead and so we rise with Christ Christ ascends into heaven and because he ascends into heaven we're seated in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus until he returns when he returns he returns with thousands and thousands of his holy ones and we return as well he rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years and guess what we're ruling and reigning with Christ on earth for a thousand years why because we're in Christ what's the pen doing precisely nothing right the pen has just been inserted into Christ right so it's all by grace I am saved by grace I die with Christ by grace I rise to new life by grace I have my sins forgiven by grace I'm made a citizen of heaven by grace I'm taken from the guttermost to the uttermost by grace and it has nothing to do with John and when, and when I return when I you know uh, when Jesus returns if it's after I pass away and I return with him that'll be by grace and when I dwell on earth for a thousand years it'll be by grace because I am just a believer inserted into Christ and when you persecute the believer you're persecuting Christ when Paul was persecuting the, the soul at that stage he said uh, Saul Saul why are you persecuting me why because the believers in Christ where the head is the body goes it's pretty so where the body of Christ is the head so we're kind of connected right so we're intimately re re uh, related to that and because of that we have a spiritual authority where we can cast out demons and heal the sick and do, do things like that so because you're in Christ you have a spiritual authority that doesn't make sense to you at the moment but you have to receive spiritually you have to believe that you have that authority it's invisible to us it's one of those invisible things that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the mind of man but which is revealed to you by the Holy Spirit and you've got to have God reveal to you your authority and you've got to believe it is real and then you can operate in it but while it's just a fanciful idea at the back of your head you're not going to operate in it uh, you have to really believe that God's given you authority and that authority means that you have some authority over the sickness uh, Jesus occasionally saw sickness as a direct result of sin he would like the paralyzed man he would say your sins are forgiven and then he would say uh, rise up and walk take your mat and go home so forgive this person sins first and then heal them because sin messes up our relationship with God if sin messes up our spirit our spirit is connected to our soul and our body and when our spirit is messed up it messes up our soul and our body so we need to go to ask, sometimes ask people uh, how they have some bitterness in their heart do they have anger do they have rage and when their sin is forgiven when they connect, uh, connect, confess their sin healing comes much more easily a person who is full of bitterness rage and resentment will often have other things that are coming what we call a psychosomatic illness in today's terms uh, and that psychosomatic illness uh, will uh, result in things and they need to confess their sins they need to get right with God uh, in order to be healed and other times he said the sinners of the uh, the sicknesses of the devil uh, like said of the woman bent over has not this woman who's been bound by Satan these 18 years uh, should she not be healed and so he prayed the demon was binding her over was cast out and she was straightened up similarly with people who are blind and deaf who cast out the demon of blindness and deafness and the person would be healed because it was an attack of the devil that was causing that particular sickness Jesus often called, drew a, a direct connection between faith and healing your faith has healed you go in peace right uh, and so there's a lot of connection between faith and healing and people who have faith have uh, greater healings uh, uh, in the New Testament healing is associated with the presence of God you know cleanse the, heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead uh, preach the kingdom of God when God's rule and reign arrives when God takes over the world people get healed when the devil takes over the world people get sick right 
When humans take over the world, it's pretty dysfunctional uh, uh, and it's powerless. But, uh, but when God takes over the world, it becomes a place of love, peace and joy and people are healed because God's rule and reign is a place of healing and blessing. So when God takes over, he takes over a world in a way where you become whole. He wants you to be whole and when his rule and reign is there, you become whole. Jesus taught that healing was a work that his disciples could also do and commissioned first the 12, then the 70, then the wider church to do so. So he starts with the 12 uh, in Luke 9 and in Matthew 10 and he says, go out into all the villages of Israel two by two uh, and heal the sick, uh, raise the dead, etc, etc. And he says, I've given you authority to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. So at this point he has to give them authority because the cross hasn't happened yet. And then, and then uh, he takes out the 70 in Luke 10. He says, oh, now I've given you authority, and he gives them authority, and they go out and, and they come back, and then Satan's falling from heaven uh, like lightning because of all the revival that's taking place. But after the cross, the authority is given through the cross. Jesus doesn't have to be here giving us authority because the cross has happened. So because the cross has happened, we are now have authority and Mark 16 says, these miracles will follow them that believe. So it's now everybody has authority to, to, to do it. And John 14, 12 says, those, uh, you've seen these, but uh, those who believe will do greater works. Uh, let's look at John 14, 12 uh, at, at that. Uh, so we have some idea what the, what's happening for believers now. And that's because the Holy Spirit is given to us. In, okay, John 14, 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. So he goes to the Father. The Holy Spirit is released onto the earth through the ascension. And because we're in him, he's gone to the Father, we're in him, we're now in the heavenly realms, we're now citizens of heaven. We're now born again, we're born of God, we're flowing in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's given to us, in us and upon us. We can now do the greater works. He did these great works of healing, he says those who believe and those who come into the gifts can do these greater works. And so we're, we're to uh, do that, we're to do the greater works of God uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, something uh, we can do. Okay. Jesus saw healing as a vivid demonstration of mercy of, and compassion of God towards the lost and suffering. Healing is never earned in any way. And for those of you from Catholic backgrounds or backgrounds where heal, you only got healing if you were really good and said the rosary you know, 500 times or something, and you had to go to church a lot to get healed, that is a load of nonsense. Right? All those people that got healed by Jesus, he just walked out into a crowd of you know, fishermen and slaves and people that hadn't been to church in years and he got them healed. They weren't necessarily good people. Uh, God is gracious to the just and the unjust. He heals all sorts of people from all sorts of stuff uh, and healing is never earned. He never says, because you're such a good boy, I'm healing you. Or well, Martha, you're such a good girl, I'm going to heal you. Never says that. Right? He never says, well, look, Mr. Pharisee, you, you tithed and, and you, and you uh, fasted twice a week and you know the Bible backwards, so you're top of my list for healing. He never does that. He never selects people and says, because you're such a good boy or good girl, you're going to get healed. That doesn't happen. Right? That's, that's not part of Jesus' perspective. Now, as a missionary, and as a person who's been painfully good all my life, and has never even been to a wild party, and, and who is probably the most boring person on the planet, I, I, I used to get annoyed at this, because I'd say to God, God, I've been very, 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 very good. How come the miracles don't happen to me because I'm so good? This was years ago, right? When I was younger, and I said, but I, I'm really, you know, I know the Bible and I'm a missionary and how come they're not happening to me? How come that person got a miracle and they're a complete basket case? Right? 
Uh, and they would get the miracles. And the new Christians would get the miracles and the older Christians wouldn't. I mean, you've seen that, Pastor Romy, right? The new Christians are often the, the people that just come off drugs. They're the ones that are, are getting all the miracles. And here am I working in the church and I'm not seeing the miracles. <laughs> because it's nothing to do with how good I am. It's to do with the compassion of God. And when that person's just come off heroin or something, they need a lot of the compassion of God. They need God to reach out into them and do miracles. They need those you know, wonderful testimony stories because God's compassion. Let's look at some of these verses here. Matthew 9, 27. Uh, okay. Uh, when Jesus departed from here, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come to the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to him, Do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And so they're healed. So here he is, he's, they're crying out for mercy. They're crying out for mercy. And Jesus says, okay, I'm giving you mercy. According to your faith, be it to you. And, and they're healed. Let's go to Matthew 15. 15, 22. Um, okay. That's uh, again someone crying out for mercy. 17.15. Okay, it's someone else crying out for that. There's a lot of passages where he says he was moved by compassion. Maybe I haven't got one of those in here. 20, 30 and 31. What have I got? Maybe I looked up the word mercy instead. Oh, mercy, uh, and he, he has mercy. So all those verses are about mercy, but there are other verses where it says Jesus was moved by compassion and he healed the sick uh, and he saw them as, as, as sheep without a, a shepherd uh, and he, he healed the sick so when we pray from faith love and compassion healing tends to be far more effective so if I'm all neurotic when I'm praying about healing and I'm full of fear because the person's got advanced cancer or something like that and I'm going oh I hope it works <laughs> and I, I'm out of I'm that's not gonna work right but when I feel the love and compassion of mercy in my God, God, I say, Lord, you know, and God fills me with love for that person, compassion and mercy and faith rises up in my heart and I'm really loving on the person as I'm praying for them and I'm just being moved by God. That's when the stuff starts to happen. Right? And for your first duty when you pray for the sick is to love the person. You know, you get some healers that are really harsh. And they're all proud of themselves and the healing ability. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let them just flow in healing and then and let them flow in love and mercy and compassion. The best healing ministry I've ever seen was in Sydney by an Anglican guy called Canon Jim Glennon who wrote the book The Kingdom of God is Within You. Yeah? Uh, that one is in uh, Matthew 9. Matthew 9:36. Okay, let's have a look at that. Uh, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered, like having uh, sheep and no shepherd. And just above that, he, he was teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. So he had compassion on them, and he moved out of compassion towards the people that were afflicted and hurting and broken and lost and beaten up by sin and beaten up by the society and rejected he had compassion on them he had compassion on the demon possessed the demon possessed are pretty hard to deal with and uh, when someone's really out out you know like legion you know running around naked breaking things and just plain scary he could like jesus love was so great that he could reach out to someone that would freak most of us out certainly would freak me out uh, uh, and so we've got to get past being freaked out. We've got to get past being, uh, you know, uh, when I go to hospital, you see someone with all the tubes in them, and it's like, <laughs> we have to get over that, right? Just say, get over that reaction and feel love and compassion for the person. I am not medical, you know? Uh, uh, I don't fade at the sight of blood, but I'm nearly that bad. Uh, uh, and so going into the hospital, I've got to get over my non-medical feelings, get over the sight of, of the tubes and stuff, and pray for the person out of love and compassion. And you've got to do a little bit of emotional processing to get 
to where you're supposed to be uh, before you, you, you heal. Some people it's very easy for them. Uh, but uh, okay, so we don't want to pray for fear, doubt or judgmentalism. You know, I know someone who went to pray, had a very bad shoulder problem, went to the uh, pastors of a certain church in Australia for healing and they, this person was going through university and working in a hotel to put herself through university. And they said, until you stop working in that wicked hotel, it wasn't a particularly wicked hotel, but, it, but according to these very fundamentalists, well, oh, we are not praying for your healing. Well, that's not helpful, is it? That's not gonna, that doesn't help anyone get better. Do you think Jesus would say that? No. Nah. Right. So we've got to get past that kind of judgmental stuff. Uh, and Jesus never said to anybody, this sickness is there because you're, you're a da 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 and, and put them down, right? Jesus never puts anyone down. He does ask them to confess their sin, but he doesn't slam anyone like that. You don't ever see it. Okay. Jesus frequently healed out of compassion. Uh, that's the uh, yeah, and that's that's there as well. Matthew 14, 14. Let's see what that says. Uh, and a great when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Okay, Jesus always healed just what the person wanted healed. So a person says, "I want to be cleansed from leprosy." He didn't heal their eyes. He healed their leprosy. And you get people say, well, you know, I know you want this healed, Brother John, but we really think you need to be healed of intellectualism. <laughs> you know, I must have heard that 20 times in my life. <laughs> so, uh, because people think, well, you know, actually it's your emotions and your, 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 your mind. You've got to get out of your mind before God. Oh, crumbs. <laughs> uh, uh, and so Jesus always healed what the person wanted to heal, leprosy, blindness, etc. Jesus never told someone to wait for healing in order to develop patience and character. When someone's limping along and they're lame, he says, doesn't say you've got to be lame for another six months. You know? He healed them right there and then. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, which are fearfully and wonderfully made by God, and which will be raised from the dead in the last day down. We, in, that, in the West particularly, not so much in the Philippines and other countries, but in America, Australia and Europe, we have this dichotomy between the spiritual and the material. Uh, we split it in half, we say our bodies are unimportant, but our spirits and souls are very important. Our minds are important, but the body, oh, it's just a lump of matter that we carry around with us. That's not the Hebrew tradition, it's not the biblical tradition, it's not the Christian tradition. It's Platonic idealism, if you want to really get a label on it. Right. So, Jesus says, your body is important because, and it's so important that he spent a big chunk of his ministry healing human bodies. He didn't just address souls, bodies were important, which, why he, which is why he healed them. And he took, uh, he, uh, the bodies were so important that on the cross, by his stripes, we were healed. It's part of the work of the cross because the human body is important. Human body is so important, God comes and indwells our bodies through the Holy Spirit. And makes them his temples. He thinks my body, which I don't think much of, uh, I, my body is important enough to be dwell and dwelt by the Holy Spirit and to be his temple and your body as well. So, and so okay. Uh, and then not only is the body that important, but after I'm dead, he's going to raise this body up again, glorify it, and make it eternal spiritual body. You know the body that Jesus had when he went into the grave was the body that Jesus had when he came out of the grave. Right? So the resurrection body is going to be somehow related to this, like a seed is to 1 Corinthians 15, we the whole lecture on the resurrection body. But basically, and, it, and 1 Corinthians 6.13, this is a mind-blowing verse. 1 Corinthians 6.13. One Corinthians six and verse thirteen: Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both of them. Now the the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So the Lord God is for my body and your body. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to dwell in your body. He wants your body in heaven forever. So don't despise it, right? Uh, your body is really important to God, puzzlingly important. 
It's so important that he numbers the hairs on our head. Okay, he's not just looking at my soul, he's counting the number of hairs on my head which are disappearing very rapidly. <laughs> We're building a porch on the front of our house and a lot of my hair is disappearing. <laughs> I don't like construction. Uh, but so, the Lord, body is meant for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Okay, we are united to Christ, we're one spirit with him. Go, let's go 1 Corinthians 6, same chapter. Go, go, go. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take your body as a member of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them with members of a harlot? Talking about sexual, sexual immorality? Certainly not. Or do you, do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two he says shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So our body is for the Lord. It's a very sacred place. Your body is a sacred site. It's a temple. So guess what? God wants to heal his temple. Right? He wants to release the kingdom of God within you through the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to be healed. Okay. Healing is accomplished through faith in the name of Jesus that issues authoritative commands for healing. We see this in Acts 3. The, 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 sort of the great miracle of the early church where Peter and John uh, raised the lame man and there's two whole chapters on this miracle we don't have time to go through all that but in verse 16 that's the end of this whole dialogue here it's the sort of summary of it it's a 316 there's a lot of great 316 we all know John 316 well Acts 316 is also important and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, who you see and know. It's the faith which comes through him has given this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And then we, let's go back to the start of the whole thing there. And uh, verse 4, Acts 3, 4, 4, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he commands him to rise up and walk, and he does. And when you see healing in the New Testament, it's nearly always, or if not always, the result of an authoritative command. So, when Jesus comes to a leper, he doesn't say, Oh, please, leper, be healed. He goes, Be cleansed. And the leper is cleansed. And when it's eyes, he says, eyes be opened. Or ears be opened. Uh, uh, and so he gave, gives commands. Or the little girl is dead. Uh, little girl, arise. And so he's always walking around giving commands that result in healing. And wherever you go, when you see a miracle, you see a command. So Lazarus, he's dead in the grave. And... Jesus doesn't stand there and say, if it be thy will, Father, please raise Lazarus from the dead. Gets, rolls the stone out of the way and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes forth, a command is issued. Every time there's a healing, there's a command uh, a, a, of some sort happening. That's where we go back to the centurion. And Syrian says, you've got authority, you issue the word, you issue the command, my servant will be healed. Jesus issued the command, the servant was healed. Now this is the thing that changed my success rate in praying for the sick is when I learned to give commands in faith. Uh, so I pray and say, uh, over someone and I sense that this is something's happening here and so I say, you know, in Jesus' name, be healed or I would heal the specific thing that needed to be healed. I say it was an eye, I say, you know, eye be healed or headache be healed and you give a command. Now, the problem with that is you feel really stupid. All right? Everyone goes, oh, no, I've never seen a pastor pray like that. And that's not the way it's done. Well, the way it's done doesn't work. So forget about the way it's done. All right? Look at how it's done in the Bible. All right? And in the Bible, where there's a healing, there's a command. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. A command is issued by the believer and the person gets healed. So I learned to overcome my feelings of, oh, I'm going to look stupid, which is fear of man, not fear of God. And privately, I would command the person, right? It's often healing is often better done in private or quietly. And you say, Come, in Jesus' name, be healed. And it's amazing how it works, right? 
So I went from 0% to 25-30%, which is a lot better. I'd like to get up to 100%, all right? Uh, we all would. But uh, the command thing is what changed that. Okay. Now, uh, going on to miracles. Okay, miracles are also a result of mountain-moving faith. Uh, and it says in Galatians 3, 1-5, it's through faith that miracles were done in the Galatian church. There is a gift of working miracles. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians 12, we see a gift of miracles listed there in verse 29. Miracles are meant to give glory to God and are not to be done for commercial gain, bitterness, envy or self-seeking. Uh, that's in Acts 8 where Simon Magus wants to do, say, I'll give you this money, give me the gift of doing miracles. Uh, and he said, no, -uh. And he says, no, you're just envious, you're just bitter, you're in the bondage of iniquity. And no, that's not how we do miracles. Miracles, signs and wonders are slightly different terms that overlap in scripture. A sign generally reports to a prophecy or spiritual reality. So a sign signifies something. So this is a sign of the Messiah. So when Jesus, uh, John the Baptist's disciples turn up to Jesus, he gave them the signs of the, of the Messiah, the lame walk, the blind see, etc. said, look, all the signs of the Messiah are happening. And when Paul wanted to uh, validate his apostleship, I've, I've done all the signs of an apostle. These things point to his reality as an apostle. A wonder astonishes, it's a thaumaturge, uh, astonishes people and challenges their pagan or religious worldview. So, uh, so Paul's there in some pagan part of uh, Lystra or somewhere, he heals a lame man, everyone says, you're God. And he says, oh, no, we're not a God. You know, we're just men like you, but there is a God who's real. So their whole pagan worldview is being shaken by this wonder. And they're going like, what's happening here? All right, and when I was in Papua New Guinea among tribal people, you do something that's significant, and they go, oh wow, and everyone believes, right? Because it causes them to wonder, it causes their way of thinking, their stinking thinking, to get shattered, and they go, oh wow, and they start to believe. A miracle is a low probability event that is inexplicable, either in its nature, method, or timing, which must be attributed to the exercise of divine power, and they tend to be done, most of these signs, wonders, and miracles, tend to be done by apostles and church planters. So we see people like Philip, who wasn't an apostle, but he was a church planter. He had a gift in miracles, a lot of that happened. So I work with a group called Church Multiplication Coalition in the Philippines. There's about 4,000 pastors associated with it. I just help them with uh, pastor training. Uh, and, what, and they have a lot of people with the gift of miracles in the Philippines, so they'll do a miracle crusade, and there are real miracles that happen, and then they'll plant uh, out of that miracle crusade, they take the, the, the people that have given their lives to Jesus, they put them into Bible studies, they turn those Bible studies into churches. So the miracle is a way of leading people to Jesus. As they say, okay, this is better than our tribal areas in the Philippines, this is better than that. And so it's CMC, uh, and they're based out of Cebu, I'll be going to, to again there in uh, October uh, to be with them. So when you're planning the gospel, doing missionary work, uh, miracles tend to happen more often. Okay, now we've got five minutes before we go into application. Have you got some questions? Have you got some questions? Of course you've got questions. Fire away. Yeah, go ahead. So, is healing is one of the gifts? Yeah, yeah. So, means that some people can and some people Okay, everyone has the ability to pray for the sick, and that's a Christian sort of thing that we do. But some people have an extra gift of healing. Right? And their ministry is healing. Uh, and like in this church, uh, Charity Abracosa has a gift of inner healing. See, she has a, a gift of doing that. There are other people who have gifts of healing in this church. Uh, and uh, so there are people that are gifted in a particular area and they move in that. They tend to be very sensitive people. Uh, and so the, uh, uh, there are... There are, are people that are more gifted in healing. Now, I don't think I've got a gift of healing. I think I simply operate pastorally as an elder of the church who's supposed to pray for the sick by faith and raise them up. Uh, so that's beyond, I'm, I don't think I'm actually a gifted healer. I think I have my gifts in teaching. But we operate in healing because it's part of the kingdom of God. Okay. Any other questions? 